quality of life. And starting us off will be John Carlson. Yay! <laughs> thank you, uh, Council Chair, Council Members. Thank you for uh, having us here again this afternoon to talk a little bit about city budget and outcomes and how we all do our work together to continue to make the city a great place to be. I am John Carlson. I work in Mayor Gaylor Baird's office, and I'm part of the budget team that does some of that work. Um, as you know, we've had a couple of meetings before. We're on our third of five outcome um, meetings to talk about this. Today we're going to talk about vibrant city economy and quality of life, as was mentioned. And just pulling some stuff out of the budget book, just for folks at home as a reminder, you know, this outcome, again, is our goal is to keep Lincoln as the quality of life capital of the country. And while those of us that are already here know that that's true, we want to continue to do our work to make it even better and continue to encourage people to be here, work here, live here, play here, go to school here, raise families here. It's a great place to be. So obviously with this budget outcome, a lot of our programming is focused on economic development, high quality, good paying jobs, innovation, entrepreneurship, workforce you'll hear more about today, lifelong learning, community literacy, safe and reliable transportation, then also things like parks, green space, cultural activities, arts. Uh, as you do polling across the country and when you talk to economic development and the Lincoln Chamber of Commerce, you can tell that those high quality amenities really are one of the things that they use as a recruitment tool to help uh, recruit people to come to Lincoln, both businesses, students, and, and employees and workers. So we've got four uh, departments slash programs here to talk to you today, Parks and Rec, Lincoln Libraries, Lincoln Forward, and Urban Development. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Director Lynn Johnson from the City Parks and Rec. Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. <laughs> Somehow I got this. All right. Technology will be trained. He is a parks director, though. Yeah, uh, yeah, but he can't run technology apparently. Right here, so there we go. All right. You got it. Thank you. <laughs> we'll try this again. My name is Lynn Johnson. I am the director of the Parks and Recreation Department in Lincoln. Um, you can see that our mission statement is wrapped around youth development, about active, healthy living, uh, about um, managing green spaces, both designed and natural, about assisting with special events in the community. And then we truly believe that, that the quality of life, is, as John said, is instrumental to our economic development strategy. Our core values are positive attitude, uh, customer friendly, being customer friendly, promoting teamwork, and servant leadership. The department is organized into five divisions. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but you can see the way that the activities and programs are organized um, among those, those five divisions. Um, we have a total of about 283 FTEs. In the general fund, there are 253 FTEs. About 158 of those are full-time classified positions. About 125 of those are unclassified part-time and seasonal positions. So you can see it's about a 60-40% split. The golf fund is about another 30 FTEs. And as, as, pardon me, as I said, uh, the department has about 283 FTEs total. Uh, the department's operating budget, the general fund portion of the operating budget, is approaching $18 million. We generate about 20% of the general fund, uh, uh, pardon me, of the operating, the general fund portion of the operating budget through user fees and uh, fee-based programs. And the golf fund is about $4.1 million budget. And I think, as you know, the golf fund is managed as an enterprise fund, so that it operates off of the funds that it, it generates primarily through user fees. So the overall department budget is about 20 point, pardon me, $22.1 million. We have some key indicators that we use to advise our work and that we use for reporting on our work. Uh, the first of those is the Emerald Ashbore Response and Recovery Program. 
And I, th I think as, as the city council certainly knows, this is a program that is now fully funded and we're, we're truly in the implementation phase. In 2019-20, uh, we removed uh, just over 1,000 uh, public ash trees and we planted about 1,600 trees to replace those ash trees. And last year, we had the initial, um, uh, uh, the initial effort to begin staff treatment of public ash trees. And we, uh, we staff treated about 700 public ash trees last year. And you can see that the, the target for, um, for next fiscal year is removal of 800 public ash trees, planting of, eight, of 800 trees to replace those, and then treating about 1,700 public ash trees. Um, we know from research that having outdoor recreation facilities in close proximity to where people live promotes quality of life. It also promotes uh, healthy living. And about 86% of Lincoln's residents are within a 10 minute walk or about a half mile of, of a park facility. Um, we also know that kind of a hallmark of Lincoln Parks and Recreation and Lincoln overall is the, is the nationally recognized trail system. Um, I just heard uh, a comment on Lincoln's trail system that Lincoln is, and actually those of you who attended the, the uh, GPTN annual meeting heard that uh, Lincoln is recognized for having the most, one of the most accessible trail systems in the nation. So I think that's fairly significant. We want to maintain or sustain that standard of having about 3.71 miles of trails per 10,000 residents. And uh, green space is also uh, kind of a hallmark of, of the Parks and Recreation System and of Lincoln. And we manage about one in nine acres in the city or about 11% of the city uh, is parkland and open space as compared to uh, the overall city limits. Uh, the, our focus for 2021-22 will be reestablishing levels of service for programs and facilities after the, the pandemic. And really much of the rest of my presentation is gonna be sharing with you information about the level of service that we provided during the last fiscal year and then what we're anticipating for 21-22. And we're gonna start with parks operations. Um, the park mowing cycle is one of the measures that we have for our park operations sections. You may know that we essentially mow park areas on a circuit. So the park mowing cycle is uh, the number of days it takes uh, to get back to that beginning point of the circuit as we're mowing those circuits in the district. And with the pandemic last year, you know that um, we had, we, we did not have park restrooms open. Uh, we were not servicing uh, park indoor shelters. We had outdoor shelters open, but they weren't rentable. And we were really hoping that we'd be able to shift some of that labor and attention away from regular, that kind of regular maintenance to park mowing. And what you can see happened is that this is the information summarized from our parks district. One of our districts was able to get down to a mowing cycle of about 10 days. The other two of the mowing, or two of the districts were just over 14 days and the fourth district was just over 15 days. And I'll talk a little bit about why that was in a second, but one of the things that we saw is that there was a significant amount of use of park areas, particularly on weekends um, during the spring and during the summer. And park staff uh, spent time on Mondays and sometimes into Tuesdays getting large park areas cleaned up after all of that use. And so we were not able to shift as much time to park mowing as, as we'd originally anticipated. Right now we're anticipating for 21-22 that we would be maintaining that mowing cycle, or that park mowing cycle of 14 days. You can see that we rented about half of the number of facilities that, that we would normally, and we also had about half of the number of special events occurring in parks uh, that we would normally. A little bit hard to see, but maybe I'll see if I can, can highlight this. Um, these two areas on this chart is park mowing. And you can see that, oops, that was not what I wanted to do. You can see back in fiscal year 1819, about 16% 16 of park uh, operations staff was involved in mowing. We thought that that percentage would actually go up. And in 1920, it was about 17%. Where we thought that time would come from is this category right here, janitorial cleaning. And that janitorial cleaning category remained at 20%. And so even though we weren't involved in servicing restrooms and servicing shelters, we spent uh, essentially an equivalent amount of time making sure that park areas were cleaned after the significant amount of use that they received last summer. 
The other area that I might, oops, I'm gonna have to quit doing that. Other areas that I might focus, event support went from 3% to 1%. We envision that depend, that percentage of time supporting events will increase as we increase the number of, of special events. And you'll also see that the amount of time or the percentage of time dedicated to administrative activities went from 8% to 10%. And we think that a lot of that really had to do with the learning and the training associated with the new Oracle time entry system. And we anticipate that that, that percentage of time will drop back, back down to that 8% um, during fiscal year 21-22. Community forestry, I'm gonna spend just a little bit of time on this slide, and then I'm really gonna spend most of the time on community forestry on the next two slides. Um, you can see that the percentage of, of trees trimmed, and actually there's an error on the slide. In 1819, where that says 6%, it was actually 3.1%. That was a, a typographical error on the slide. We were actually, we trimmed about 2.8, or we pruned about 2.8% of the trees last fiscal year. And that 6% is really kind of an aspirational number, and I'll tell you about that here in just a second. You can see that the calls for service increased fairly dramatically last year, and I'll talk a little bit about that. The other number I think that's important on this sheet is the number of new trees planted in new subdivisions. We planted about, about 827 new trees were planted in subdivisions um, last fiscal year. And that is because of the city's subdivision standard that requires that new street trees uh, be planted in new subdivisions. So you can see that the number of new, of new street trees every year is increasing by about 1% a year. And the other thing that's so significant about those young trees is that they really should be seen about every five years. So about for, for their first 15 years in life. So we really should trim them at about five years, at about 10 years, and then a third time at about 15 years. So here's what's really going on. Um, this um, slide shows the, the percentage, or pardon me, the actual number of trees that were pruned during the last 10 years. I'll talk a little bit about that spike that happened from in fiscal year 12-13 and 13-14. Um, we tried a method of, or we tried a strategy of having park operations staff be involved in pruning street trees, particularly young street trees, during the winter during those two years. And you can see that actually we, get, we increased the number of trees that were trimmed fairly significantly. Uh, but what's happened is that um, with Emerald Ash Borer, the park operations staff are now involved in removing ash trees from parks during the winter months, and so we don't really have that capacity to shift them, at least at this time, to pruning young street trees. Um, you can see that our target, if we were to have a 12-year pruning cycle, which is probably ideally where we think we would want to be, we'd need to be pruning about 7,300 trees a year. And you can see that we've averaged over the last, uh, last pardon me, the last five years in about that 2,500, 2,600 um, uh, trees a year range. What happened in 1920, you may remember, was that we had five back-to-back -back storms in June and early July. And the parks operations staff ended up spending essentially the entire summer through the month of August cleaning up after those storms. And so time that they would have been involved doing more proactive pruning of street trees, they were actually involved in storm cleanup. And I think there's kind of a little bit of a causal relationship here. If we were pruning street trees on a more frequent cycle, we would probably see less, less damage to the trees and we would spend less time cleaning up. Um, so I don't, there, this probably is not something we're gonna be able to solve in the next budget year just because of probably the financial, some of the financial challenges we're seeking. But I wanna kind of keep this um, at the front of your minds as we're talking about budget that we need to talk about additional resources in the future. And we'd also have fewer claims on trees falling on property and damaging stuff. That's, that's exactly true. And I think that probably leads to this slide as a matter of fact. The cause for service related to trees is increasing. You can see that it's been an upward climb since 1314, and we actually peaked out last summer at about over 6,000 calls for service. And again, I think that's probably related in part to the, to the five back-to-back -back storms last summer, but I also think that it has to do with the pruning cycle, that if we were pruning on a more proactive method, I think we'd have less calls for service. So again, not something we're probably going to serve next fiscal year or solve next fiscal year, but something to, to be aware of. 
Um, uh, youth programming at recreation centers and community centers did continue. And uh, we actually we had reduced sizes, though, because of the requirements for child care programs. And so, for example, during summer day camps, we would normally at a couple of our recreation centers see about 120 children a day at those programs. Last year, we were at about, about 60. We could have two groups of 30 in the facilities. Um, the the uh, community, particularly the community learning centers, pivoted to other types of activities. An example is that the Everett Community Learning Center um, delivered, made 240 deliveries of art supplies to children during the summer to keep them engaged in activities. Therapeutic and adaptive recreation programs also pivoted. Um, those numbers for 1920 um, include really a shift to the adult day structure program was multiple phone calls with the participants uh, throughout the week to check on them, see how they're doing. And we actually made deliveries of garden produce to a number of those, uh, a number of those participants during the summer last year. And then the Adaptive Recreation Club participants, they shifted to Zoom. And we had attendance overall uh, after the pandemic started of over 1,250 uh, Adaptive Recreation Club participants participated in activities by Zoom. Those happened at least weekly. And I think one of the highlights of the year was the, the holiday ball that I think a number of you may have been involved in. That actually happened by Zoom. And so the, there were people uh, singing carols and, and sharing stories by, by Zoom during the holidays. And so it was really nice. You're going to see that, that um, we actually are predict, pre predicting um, a, a decrease of the number of participants for fiscal year 21-22, and that's really an indication of the populations in both of these, or people in, in both of these uh, programs are aging at this point, and we're seeing a, a, a gradual decline in the number of participants. Team sports programs, um, you know that we ended up canceling a number of team sports programs and actually doing a number of refunds. We saw just about half of the number of youth sports registrations that we would have, and um, about, uh, about 30 or so less adult sports teams registered, and we're anticipating by fiscal year 21-22 that those programs will have, have recovered to at least their prior levels. Pools during uh, last summer, uh, we operated, you probably know, we operated five out of the nine pools. We operated the five neighborhood pools. They were operated on two-hour shifts with reduced capacity, and we had 380, a uh, little, little, pardon me, we had a little over 38,000 uh, admissions. One of the new things that happened last summer was we had a lot of interest from the child care centers, local child care centers, in having time in the pools during the summer, or pardon me, during the mornings. And we actually anticipate uh, continuing that as a program, a service that we'll be providing. We did not offer swim and dive league program, and we did not have any pool rentals um, last fiscal year. But you can see that we'll be recovering to what we, we see as being essentially the normal level of service and activities with outdoor pools uh, next fiscal year. The Nature Center, we did um, cancel some programs and activities for fee-based programs and, and saw lesser participation because of that. You can see that we'll be a, we think we'll be at about 67,000 fee-based program participants in next fiscal year. What this doesn't show is that particularly in the spring and early summer last year, the Nature Center saw really a significant number of uh, an increase in the, in the number of people who are visiting the Nature Center and walking the trails last, last spring and summer because of the pandemic. We hope that some of that continues. Perhaps the bright spot in terms of parks and recreation in the pandemic was we saw a significant increase in golf play last summer and also golf revenue. Um, we, we had over 185,000 rounds played across the five golf courses. We budget for about 163,000 rounds on average. And we saw a decrease in the number of people participating in player development programs. And we anticipate that that'll be recovering to about 1,250 people participating in those programs um, next fiscal year. Um, you have seen these, by char these pie charts before. Um, I think, as, as you'll remember, every two years we update what we call our 10-year facilities plan. And that's really a look forward at um, all of our facilities that we're envisioning are going to be needing some work on repair and replacement. When We'll be preparing that plan again this year, but when we last prepared that plan um, a year and a half ago, 
Um, we saw a need for about, on average, about $3.1 million of funding for uh, repair and replacement. Um, we have some dedicated funding sources, as you can see on the sheet, about $1.56 million is Kino funds. Uh, the cell towers generate about $280,000 a year. And then we have a gap of about $1.15 million that is unfunded. Um, from budget year to budget year, uh, a portion of that gap generally gets funded through general revenue. And you can see for the current fiscal year, we have $755,000 of general revenue in the capital improvement program. So we have a gap which is unfunded or deferred maintenance of about $397,000. Uh, the major programs that, that are major projects that are going to be going on is we are bidding or rebidding the Cascade Fountain Renovation Project. Uh, we'll be taking bids uh, this weekend, and hopefully uh, we anticipate we'll get a bid this within our budget, and we'll be moving forward with that project. It'll be under construction this summer. It'll be completed in the fall of 2021, and we're anticipating a dedication in the spring of 2022. Uh, the new Air Park Recreation Center, Williams Branch Library, is a project that we are very excited about. This is a great collaboration with Lincoln City Libraries. And um, we'll be before you in late March and early April to talk about certificate of participation funding for that project. And construction will begin on that project uh, sometime in the summer or fall, and we envision it'll be finished in early 2023. We received a notice just recently of a $400,000 grant of, of federal land and water conservation fund funding for the Irvingdale and Rudge Parks renovation. And we'll be doing just about a million dollars worth of work in those two parks when that'll be completed in the fall of 2022. Uh, we've been also developing a user experience master plan for Wilderness Park. Uh, the mayor is very interested in seeing if we can increase use and accessibility by making the park more legible. And so that people feel like when they arrive, they have an understanding of the trail system and how they move throughout the park. And we're beginning uh, uh, phase one improvements uh, this summer on that project. And the other project I wanted to highlight a little bit, um, um, for about 30 years, we grew or we had the bedding plants for sunken gardens grown contractually. And the uh, local nurseries who have the interest or the ability uh, to grow bedding plants has essentially waned at this point. We don't have anybody really interested in that contract anymore. Um, Finkies has allowed us to rent their greenhouse uh, for the last two winters. They've notified us that we will not have that ability after this year. And so um, we're actually proposing to build a greenhouse so that we can grow the bedding plants uh, for the sunken gardens and, and other places, but primarily for sunken gardens for future years. And we will have a CIP amendment that will be coming uh, before the city council to fund that project. We're really moving some funds around within the CIP to get that project covered. It's about a $380,000 project. We did a life cycle cost on it, and we think it has about a 16-year payback in terms of us owning and managing a greenhouse as opposed to bidding out and having the plants grown by one of the regional growers. And we go through a similar process with the golf fund. We also do a 10-year facilities plan for the golf fund. Um, we have, we've identified about $470,000 of needs for repair and replacement on an annualized basis. A big portion of that is, is irrigation systems, to be perfectly honest. You can see the funding sources that are committed to the golf uh, capital improvement program. We have two different surcharges. Uh, one of those is the Holmes Clubhouse surcharge. And I'm happy to say that in September, we will have paid off uh, the clubhouse. And we'll actually be uh, talking with the Golf Advisory Committee and the Parks and Recreation Advisory Board in March about keeping that surcharge in place and shifting it to funding replacement of uh, the irrigation system, or the, the new irrigation system at Pioneer's Golf Course. And that will be part of that certificate of participation bond funding that will be before the city council in late March and early, early April. And we're just completing a very nice renovation project at uh, the Clancy Woman Clubhouse at Highlands Golf Course of new flooring, um, new tile, uh, some paint, and actually some new tables and chairs. All of those were 28 years old and original to the golf course. So we got good value out of those, but it is, it's time to do a replacement, kind of a refresh. And with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions that you may have this afternoon. Does anyone have any questions for Director Johnson? 
Councilwoman Washington. <laughs> Director Johnson, good afternoon. Uh, I have a question about the greenhouse project yeah. that you'd like to amend the CIP to, to accomplish. I know that um, the Sunken Gardens is a really uh, a very treasured resource in Lincoln. I also know that there are people who have commercial benefit from um, taking photographs of special events at the Sunken Gardens, and I am just curious if it's ever been considered a small enterprise-like fund to help offset the cost of this project. Might be a photography fund uh, fee. Have you it, considered that? It has been discussed. We've never implemented it, but it may be time to, to have serious discussion with the local photographers because, as you say, there's a lot of wedding photo photos, a lot of senior photos mm -hmm. that happen in that garden, and, and maybe we could have a small license fee that would help fund the, those bedding plants. Yeah, it's, just, it's a, something that just crossed my mind. Um, and then um, everything else just it looks like... Uh, I wish you the very best of luck in regaining the levels of service. Let's just see what happens. Thank you. Councilman Christian. I, I would just uh, talk to me later. So I have some questions about Highlands Golf Course and the playability and how many people are playing and at, at that golf course specifically and that stuff, okay? Yeah, I'd be happy to, absolutely. Any other questions for Director Johnson? All right, thank you so much, Director. Thank you, thank you. I believe next we're going to move into uh, Lincoln Libraries with Director Pat Leach. Yay. Hello, everyone. I'm happy to be here today and appreciate this opportunity. I'm Always happy to talk libraries, and I do think a vibrant city deserves a vibrant library. So I'll talk to you a little bit about how we see that happening uh, through our budget process. Um, when we're thinking of our vision, which has to do with what we call a library experience, we are wanting to set a distinctive tone, promoting and providing lifelong learning and education for our whole community. We set out what we call the performance standards here, and I, as Lynn, uh, will call to your attention that in this year of COVID, that has looked a whole lot different. So for years, we've said libraries are more than books. And a lot of what the more is has to do with things like weekly learning times, which is what we call our story times, bringing big groups of people together for summer reading programs, doing those sorts of events that both bring new people to the library and really support children as they become members of our reading community. So when, um, when we're looking at our performance standards, so for instance, uh, one of the measures is how many, what percentage of youth ages 0 through 13 are part of our summer reading program. And our goal is 20%. Um, last year, it was 6.6% .6 who participated. So we're concerned about that number um, as we move forward for planning for this year's summer reading program, which we believe things will be more open, people will be a little bit more comfortable, it will look different. Um, but as we looked at last year's figures, we're thinking a lot about how do we make sure that we have high participation for our summer program. Another one of the things that we look at, and this is sort of a basic for libraries across the country, is per capita circulation. So. What is the circulation overall of books and other materials uh, per, the, per the population? So in the most recent fiscal year, our number was 8.2. And what we wish to have is 9.8. So again, that's a figure that dropped down quite a bit. What's interesting about that number, and I'll talk more about that later, is Visits to libraries are half what they were before. People just aren't getting out like they used to. Our circulation hasn't dropped by half, though, and I'll talk a little bit about how we've addressed that. Um, then our other primary performance standard is the number of different bookings that we have for our community meeting rooms, which is a service that quite a few people use, and sometimes um, we forget how much of a community center a library is. So here comes a review of each of those numbers. Um, our summer reading challenge number, you know, we're noting the year of COVID there with a much different pattern. 
And so uh, we're thinking a lot about what will that look like this year? How do we ensure participation? We do a lot of our promotion for the summer reading program through Lincoln Public Schools. So we'll be working with them as well as with the other schools in Lincoln to say, how can we get in to promote? What can we do to make that happen? You know, given, given that situations are much different. So um, what we hope to see, of course, is the, both of those bars going back up significantly in the years ahead. Then as we look at our per capita checkout rate, this is another one where what we want to do is maintain. And instead, we saw a significant decrease last year. Again, wishing to see that go up once we're back out from under the era of COVID. Uh, I want to show you a, a chart related to circulation. So the orangish bars here show our total circulation of materials at the library. The blue bars Next to those are the amount of downloadable circulation that we have. So those would be downloadable ebooks or audiobooks that can be checked out through the library's website. And we had a pretty significant jump in the use of downloadables, which is what you would expect in a year where many people were choosing uh, to stay home as much as possible. The slanted blue line um, indicates the percentage of our circulation that is done by downloadable material. So that clearly is going up. And um, I think that last year I spent some time talking with you all about the challenges of downloadable materials for libraries from a budget perspective. They are expensive, and yet our people want them. We're in a very interesting time right now where clearly people still want to check out print books and actual items. But with COVID, we had quite a few calls from people who wanted to uh, use their library card solely to download materials. We took quite a few calls from people who hadn't had library cards before, but wished to begin using downloadable materials. So that's part of the increase in the use of those. So as we look at our budget and look at how we manage the services that we provide, that balance between downloadable and actual materials is really important. What we have been able to do to some degree prior to COVID is it takes quite a bit of staff time to manage an item, you know, from checking it out to somebody, checking it back in, getting it back on a shelf. We don't have all of that kind of staff interaction when we have a downloadable item. We do pay more for the item, but we're able to use the resulting staff time to increase the amount of programming that we do. So we're able to have a fuller range of library learning times. We're able to have those library learning times evenings and weekends as well as during the week. So. Uh, with COVID shutting down that in-person programming, it, it certainly has impacted how we're able to serve the community. So we're thinking a lot about as we come out from COVID, what will be the behaviors that will remain and what will be the ones where people will be eager to come back and do the things that they did prior to COVID. Meeting room bookings um, also went down. I think that's pretty much as, as you would expect. And again, we are watching this one closely in that uh, many of you know that sometimes it's difficult to find a nice meeting room space that you can have free of charge. On the other hand, in the era of Zoom, we'll be watching. You know, how much do people say Zoom is working pretty well for us versus booking a library meeting room? So that is certainly something that we'll be watching as well. Um, these two pie charts show our sources of funding and expenditures. You know, there's an interesting aspect on our funding sources that the big orange part there is city property tax. The library has something that's called the library fund. And it's funded a little bit differently than the city's general revenue sources. And the library fund, for whatever reason, gets infusions simply from city property tax. But it's part of our overall budget. So frankly, it's seen in that way as we budget. We also get a significant amount of funding from the county because we serve the county outside the city via an interlocal agreement. So um, that's one of our other um, aspects of funding sources. In the year ahead, as we look to the second year here of what would usually be a biennial budget, we're not anticipating great changes in our budget. So what you heard from me last year is very similar to what we are planning for the year ahead. I will note that our personnel services cost around 67 to 70% of our budget, so that's a major part of 
the Lincoln City Library's budget. I'm sorry you can't see this one a little bit better. This talks about our number of FTEs. And last year we lost one full-time FTE from our Information Technology Department. We did gain a .5 FTE to address our community program to encourage reading aloud to young children. So we do have a person in place doing that work in the community. So overall it was a net loss of a half of an FTE for the library. So our total number of FTEs is right around 107. And listening to Lynn, we have a similar situation where many of our employees are part-time employees. So that's not all people who are 40 hour, but include a large number of unclassified staff who work uh, different numbers of hours than 40. So it's a, it's a pretty wide mix of hours and levels of staff. What I'd like to do next is talk some about some of the ways in which we address special needs during, uh, during COVID. So we put on quite a few virtual story times. We learned a lot in this process about what is it that people will pay attention to virtually, what doesn't work so well. For instance, we found out that just kind of recreating a story time for a full 30 minutes isn't really what people want. For virtual experiences, they typically want shorter. So we learned how to do that. We learned how to put on a better product in our virtual presentations. Um, learned a lot, again, about that process. And our staff went to work in figuring out how to do that better and have a better quality product. We have a service now called Teen Treasure Trove. And this relates to book bundles, which are coming up shortly. And what this does is encourage our customers to call us ahead and tell us what they want. And then our people will choose materials for them and have those ready to go. The thought being that quite right now, there's still quite a few people who aren't comfortable being in a public place. And so this shortens the amount of time that they would be in the library, gets it all ready to go so that when they come to pick up, it's a pretty brief transaction. I noted before that even though our visits are probably half what they were before, uh, our circulation is not half what it was before. We're finding that people are checking out more materials when they come to the library, even though they don't come as often. We also have similar grab and go bundles. Those are already made up. So if you're uh, looking for books for a four year old and five books about cars is going to get you through the week, we probably have a bundle of five books about cars that you can just get in a hurry. And then as I mentioned, we're happy to create bundles for people. During this time, we also created a new library app. So I don't know how many of you were using an app called Book Mine previously, but there's now one called Library LNK that I encourage you to use. Um, could only be me who's ever guilty of losing track of when her materials are due to the library, but having that information at my fingertips is really very helpful. And it's an app that connects directly, of course, to our integrated library system, and we're encouraging use of the app, uh, both for ease and just to help people keep track of, of their materials, absolutely. Um, makes it really easy to place holds and know when your holds are ready. Then um, we continued with some of our usual programming. So we still did a one book, one Lincoln program last year. Our book was Dear Edward by Anne Napolitano. One of the ways we had to shift here was that we had an author visit that was virtual. So Anne Napolitano uh, visited, I believe, from her home in Massachusetts. It was a very well-received program. I think we had around uh, 75 per people participate and was another way to provide this kind of programming for our community in an odd and interesting time. So I think that my story is probably similar to that of many of my partners, which is as we come out of COVID, we'll see what behaviors continue, what change, and how do we need to continue to listen to our customers about what it is that they have in mind. I also just want to take a brief moment uh, to mention our CIP projects for the year ahead. So Lynn mentioned the new rec center in the Arnold neighborhood. We are moving the Williams Library from Arnold Elementary School, where it currently is, to the new rec center. And we are excited about that change. Lincoln Public Schools has been a wonderful partner with us on that. We feel, though, um, as if the ability to have more flexible hours, which we would have as part of the rec center, and then just the um, synergy or partner energy of having a rec center and a library on, in the same building is really very promising and a great way to serve that community. So uh, that will be one of our CIP projects. 
The other main CIP project for us is replacement of our bookmobile. So we're beginning to pull together information about best bookmobile service, as an example of change in thinking, it used to be that our thinking was let's get the biggest vehicle we can to put the most stuff in it that we can. We're now thinking about a model that's, again, a little bit more flexible. Maybe a smaller vehicle that can get more places. Maybe instead of always inviting people onto the vehicle as if it's a small library, maybe we do deposit collections where we've talked with you and your retirement community to say what kinds of materials will you want and then would bring you a group of things and to do more programming of that sort could be the same for child care centers, schools, et cetera. So looking at potentially a different model there. And then I will also mention uh, tied to a CIP project that's a little ways down the road, we are beginning uh, the process to hire the architectural firm that will design the new central library. So as we're working with the White Lotus Development Company that's redeveloping the Pershing site, we're beginning the planning for schematic design of the central library so that as that project moves forward, the library is moving along with it. So those are our CIP projects that uh, you'll be hearing more about. Uh, the contract, for instance, for the firm that designs the building will be a multi-year contract, and so you will be seeing that um, as this year plays out. So some exciting things happening um, going forward, and uh, we're very eager to, as I said, continue to serve the community to see what stays the same and what will continue to be different after COVID. So thank you. Any questions? Seeing none, thank you so much for coming out and sharing. Yeah, you're very welcome. And I'll just note that it's my pleasure to note that Kate Bowles, who is Mayor Gaylor Baird's policy aide for economic and work workforce development, is next up. Good afternoon. Glad to be here with all of you. Uh, I want to start by just telling you one brief story about the kind of uh, work that we're doing with Lincoln Forward. Um, many of you, like me, have a loved one who's in a nursing facility or an assisted living facility. When COVID uh, hit last winter, um, those folks needed all hands on deck. And they created something called a temporary CNA certification. Um, which was a certification with um, lower educational requirements in order to get folks in the door who could care for seniors' needs um, while also um, doing it expeditiously. So those folks have been working throughout the pandemic and um, doing an incredible job meeting a need and um, responding to a crisis. But now, uh, as we get vaccines in folks' arms, um, as we turn the corner to spring, that temporary certification uh, is expiring. So this is a wonderful opportunity for Lincoln Forward's efforts and for our WIOA team to step in. Uh, our Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act is really made for this kind of circumstance. Um, we are partnering with Tabitha to identify those temporary nurse assistants who want to stay in the healthcare field, linking them up to the appropriate uh, training opportunities, helping to pay that tuition assistance, and even things like um, the required equipment or new shoes, um, and making sure that those folks who have discovered a passion for healthcare get to continue serving senior citizens. I think it's a great example of what we can and should be doing um, here at the city of Lincoln um, to move Lincoln forward um, to help both businesses and employees um, achieve their goals. So that's what this is really all about. And I will provide you um, some budget information and some technical definitions. Um, but at the end of the day, it's about two things. It's about people getting good jobs and businesses growing and succeeding. Um, that work falls under three buckets. The first is our partnership with the Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act, um, which is federal funding for workforce and job training. The second is our city's partnership with the Lincoln Partnership for Economic Development, which is really where our business uh, recruitment and retention work is housed. And the last is continuing the work of the Economic Recovery Task Force, um, which is that real time, more expeditious, um, quick time response to the circumstances of this particular year. 
and we have plenty of work to do. Um, the, this slide illustrates um, some, some less than ideal circumstances. Uh, what we found is that the coronavirus had a tale of two cities when it comes to people's employment. Um, higher income workers and moderate income workers had found some economic impacts, um, but were able to maintain a fair amount of stability. Whereas there is a significant change in unemployment um, for individuals who are low income, folks who were maybe serving in a restaurant or folks who were um, serving in an auto detailer shop um, that wasn't as utilized because people weren't driving as much. Um, and what we see in this slide is that we saw a 30.5% decline in employment for low income individuals. That's one of the major challenges we have in the coming year. So it is uh, vital that we have a WIOA program. Um, I'm very proud that the mayor is the um, elected official of record um, and that you as a city council support the mayor's work um, to make sure that these programs get uh, ser provide services to people in our city. Um, we, we have a pretty steady WIOA budget, um, but it, it, we do expect some decreases in federal funding in the coming year. Um, we expect to have some carryover funds um, and if I were sitting in your shoes, I'd say, Kate, that doesn't link up to my experience with the demand and the need out there for this kind of thing. But what we saw was that just like every other program area, every other service, um, people had to pivot. And we actually saw fewer people um, pursuing things like, um, like higher education programming um, because of the uncertainty of the coronavirus. It wasn't a perfect time for people to take that next step um, and get a student loan or commit to an, an 18 year associate or 18 month associate degree program. So we expect at least in the short term to be able to manage through um, some lost federal funding, which ironically um, we are losing because we comparatively to the rest of the nation have a lower unemployment rate. <laughs> Um, that is not anything that we uh, expect to need urgent assistance with, but it is something that the City Council should have on their radar screen um, as we continue to steward this program. Uh, the next bucket is the Lincoln Partnership for Economic Development. Um, forgive me, this slide really doesn't translate very well <laughs> to you understanding it. Um, what this is telling you is that last year in January, February, we saw some businesses just crushing it, right? Um, this purple line up here is actually restaurants. Um, we have folks like the arts and entertainment industry who at the beginning of the slide were doing incredible work um, and the, really helping the economy continue to thrive. Um, just like everyone else, uh, they were impacted by coronavirus, and we see that significant dip. Um, we're starting to see some steady, small um, growth back, but the moral of the story of this slide is really that we have different businesses with different economic impacts. Computer repair businesses are doing great. <laughs> they don't need any help from any of us except for help keeping up with the demand for their services. Um, but arts and industry parking, um, restaurants, entertainment, those kinds of businesses are going to continue to need our help as we continue uh, to recover in the long term from the pandemic. Uh, which really makes our investment in the Lincoln Partnership for Economic Development very important. Um, we are pursuing some very exciting um, business recruitment initiatives. Um, we've gotten some technical assistance over the past year to identify agribusiness, manufacturing, and financial technology as three areas where we can really draw um, businesses from across the nation. But what I really want to say here is that the Lincoln Partnership for Economic Development has important work that they do to provide services for business retention. Um, and that's that's really never been a more important service through LPED. Um, whether that's making sure that they're linked up with the Small Business Association low interest loan, or making sure that they have the tax accountant that um, has the expertise they need to draw down all their federal benefits, um, those are the kinds of things that LPED um, is designed to help with. And we know that this is important um, because <laughs> we, we continue to see that demand through LPED um, and we continue to see businesses connecting the dots and asking for that technical assistance. Um, that also rolls into some of the work that we're doing with the Economic Recovery Task Force. Um, we appreciate your support of that task force work um, over the past year. And the coronavirus issues are not going away. 
the slide shows that 33% of businesses uh, identify COVID-19 as the most important issue facing Nebraska businesses. Right behind that is that need for trained workers, um, which is sort of an ongoing and chronic issue all across the state that we need to keep our eyes on. Um, but we know that 87% of businesses have been negatively impacted um, by the outbreak, both in terms of revenue and employment. So in response, there were there were some quick um, things that the recovery task force engaged in, um, some things that were queued up before I came on board, and I'm grateful for that previous work. Um, one is the 1% more local pledge, which the business community has stepped up and really owned, committing to purchasing more of their needs locally. Um, thank you for your interest and engagement in the micro-purchasing ordinance, another strategy to support local business. Um, we were very excited to identify some federal funds um, for child care assistance. And again, when we talk about that disproportionate impact of the coronavirus on different workers and different family types, um, what we see is that workers with kids were disproportionately impacted by the coronavirus as well as working women. Um, and so there's a, a double bottom line when we invest in child care. Not only do we see um, an investment in little people, an investment in um, early education, we also see that huge sigh of relief from employers who are able to put people to work at the hours that they need them, um, are able to get the flexibility that they sometimes need from employees um, because they have the child care available to them when they need it, how they need it. Um, Recover LNK is a marketing initiative that we pushed forward um, to make sure that businesses who were um, implementing best practices for COVID-19 got good credit where credit was due. Um, and we have some other initiatives uh, coming soon. So a few things I want to highlight before I wrap it up and take your questions. Um, a few key initiatives to keep your eyes open for over the next year. Uh, our Workforce Opportunity and Innovation Act gives us the opportunity to have both a new location, a new website, and new contractual partners in the coming year. This is very exciting, um, gives us a fresh look um, and some, some new chances to serve people in new ways, um, maybe even through places like um, Pat Leach's library system. Um, for LPED, we've uh, got a partnership with Bloomberg Associates that's going to help us um, sharpen up our game in terms of uh, national business recruitment. Um, and we are exploring the establishment of something called an employee resource network, which is a strategy um, sort of like an EAP, um, an employee assistance network, but with a different menu of services, um, job coaching or transportation assistance or other problem solving. There are a few key needs that I want to put on the City Council's radar screen. Um, the first is just reiterating that we owe it is federally funded. Our allocation will decrease. We think we can manage and still provide quality services, but we may need to continue to talk about um, your shared support and investment in that initiative. Um, a, another note to make is that Luke Peltz was promoted internally. Um, to lead the Lincoln Partnership for Economic Development. They intend to fully staff LPED, um, so they intend to hire behind him and will still be able to implement those business recruitment and retention initiatives. Um, and last but not least, one recommendation of the task force was to support businesses impacted by the pandemic. Um, I would like the opportunity to continue dialogue with all of you about that work and those efforts. One of the reasons we haven't um, gone full steam ahead is that we continue to see um, support from the state and the federal level, specifically for small businesses, and we want to leverage city resources to the greatest capacity. So we want to make sure that we're complementing those efforts, not duplicating them. So that's um, my story in a nutshell. I'm happy to answer any questions you have. Are there any questions? Councilman? With the Lincoln Littles program and the matching, how much did they raise to match that on that give to Lincoln Littles Day? I will get a final number for you. The last time I checked, it was over 870,000. Um, so we have over a million dollar impact. Councilwoman? I was really interested in the CNA uh, uh, expiring, but, but giving the people assistance to stay in healthcare. Mm -hmm. And I was curious: Are there any other kinds of programs like that where we provided some assistance in the short term, just to get through this first year, um, that we're seeing an opportunity to roll into another program? 
That's that's a great question. Um, we had begun a um, healthcare collaboration effort, um, and I I think we're in a position where so that got paused just a little bit. Um, it's sort of like our Lincoln Manufacturing Council, if you're familiar with that. That got paused a little bit because our healthcare partners were drinking from the fire hose. Um, but now that now that things are beginning, I don't want to get ahead of myself, but beginning to normalize a little bit. Now that we're turning that corner, um, I think that we're we're going to see things like that employee resource network um, really being an added benefit to organizations like healthcare because what. You probably already know, I know members of this council know intimately, is that our caregiver shortage and our caregiver gap um, is growing <laughs> every minute. Um, we, we cannot keep up with that, and we're going to have to find new ways um, to keep people engaged. Um, and, and actually, as I'm speaking about this, one of those new ways is um, some innovative work being done with the Lincoln Literacy Council, um, trying to provide alternative language instruction um, for some of those folks who might be interested in healthcare. So I think there's a lot of opportunities, um, and healthcare is one of our priority areas. Thank you. Yeah. Any further questions? Thank you so much. Thank you. Up next, we have urban development. Good afternoon. I'm Dallas McGee, Assistant Director of the Department. Dan Mar Marvin would normally be here, but Dan has had another commitment, so I'm filling in for him. Let me see. Get it advanced here. There we go. Okay, our our mission fits well with the this goal of the city, which is a vibrant city economy and quality of life. We have three divisions. See if I can advance it the right way now. Uh, three divisions within the department. Uh, we have livable neighborhoods, which concentrates on neighborhoods, particularly low and moderate income neighborhoods. We have an administration division that coordinates all the activities of the department and makes sure that things are happening the way they're supposed to. And we have an economic opportunity um, division which focuses on redevelopment as well as uh, our parking services are contained within this division. Uh, we only have 21 staff. I hear Lynn with over 200 and Pat with over 100. We have a small staff, a very small staff, but uh, we work together well and, and we like to think we can get a lot done with a small staff. Here's our general fund staffing. It is about just over 1.1 million uh, for, the, for staffing and services. In terms of FTEs that are general funded, it's about nine staff. Uh, and those are in the administration division and economic opportunity. All of our livable neighborhood staff is funded primarily with federal funds, CDBG and home funds. Economic opportunities. We're going to talk a little bit about what we're doing to promote uh, economic opportunities in the city. Um, we are actively involved in anywhere from 10 to 12 redevelopment projects at any one time of the year. I can remember years ago when we were maybe involved with two or three, so that the rate of uh, activity has picked up significantly in recent years, and we see that continuing. I'll show a couple examples of projects that are underway. Um, this is the Innovation Campus, the hotel, uh, on the left is a image of, of the how the hotel would work uh, would look. On the right is the construction that, that was taken about a week ago, so it's progressing well. It's 135 uh, guest rooms as well as other facilities that are included in the hotel. Another project that is under construction on the left, you see the Cotner and P uh, apartments that were envisioned. On the right, you see. Uh, the construction. They will be available uh, this summer, about 140 units in that uh, development. 
Another project um, that we're working on is the Pershing Block. It's had a lot of interest and, and attention by the city. We've hired a developer. It's the White Lotus Group. They, have, they will be proposing, we're working with them, to implement a housing project of about 100 units, as well as a wellness facility. And Pat mentioned the library. We're, we're saving a place on this block for the library as well, if that, um, if that moves forward. So this is an exciting project that is just, just beginning. Talk a little bit about parking. Um, all of us have been impacted by COVID, and our parking revenues are certainly no exception. This shows the, the budget. The, the existing budget is about $16 million. Um, I'll get later on to talk about what our, what our income is, but it is, it, we have been impacted by COVID. Here it shows two projects that are underway. In parking on the left is the future Block 4 garage that's located at Arena Drive and O Streets. That's about a 600 stall garage. It's just getting started. If you drive by, you'll see the construction beginning. And then on the right is what was used to be the Eagle Garage at 14th and N Streets. That's being renovated into about 300 parking stalls, and that will be available uh, by May 1st. Talk a little bit about our administration division. Uh, that includes our real estate office. We buy and sell property, not only for our department, but for other city departments as well, including the parks department and the LTU. We also uh, handle this, handles all of the TIF administration to make sure that the TIF projects are moving forward and uh, develop, we're doing everything we need to do with developers. Uh, finally, this, this uh, division administers our business improvement districts throughout the city. Let's see if I can get the right slide here. And, and this shows the, um, <clears throat> the 12 districts that we have. Eight of those are maintenance districts. They're located across the city, including North 27th Street, uh, University Place, North 48th, South 48th and College View, Havelock and South Street, as well as two uh, maintenance districts in the downtown and West Haymarket area. We also have four management districts that we manage as well. Those are located in downtown and West Haymarket. Talk a little bit about the livable neighborhoods uh, division. As, as I mentioned, this neighbor, this division gets most of its funding, a lot of its funding from federal funds, CDBG and home funds. And it directs the, the funding that we get into neighborhoods, particularly older neighborhoods. Here we see on the left some improvements that were made on 11th Street, just south of downtown. And on right, you see the Splash Park that's in the Malone Holly neighborhood. Here uh, is another funding source that we use extensively, home funds. Those funds are used to assist in the revitalization of homes, particularly for low and moderate income individuals. Here's a couple examples. This is a before and after example of a rehab that uh, not only improves that property, but it gives incentives to people up and down the block to improve their properties, and we've actually seen that quite a bit uh, with some of our some of our uh, housing rehab programs. Here's another example. Uh, in addition to just housing rehab, we do uh, we assist the elderly with with needs, and we do uh, ADA accessible uh, improvements. One of, the, one of the major impacts this past year in our department is, the <clears throat> is in our Livable Neighborhoods Division, and that is the addition of about $5 million of, Lincoln, of CARES Act funding. And that's seen here uh, with the CDBG and ESG funds. Uh, we've also received 
a lead hazard uh, lead hazard control fund of just over three point four million dollars that is administered by the livable neighborhoods people to remove lead primarily from paint in older neighborhoods and um, so that's keeping us very busy and then we also received thirteen point four million dollars to assist in rent um, Help, helping people with rents and utilities. And we're working with other partners to pull that together. Uh, it's a very major um, activity for us. What are the impacts? Here's Dan with uh, the, with the, uh, the lead, con lead containment funding. We got a check for 3.4 million. Here's our parking, and this is the, an impact that I think I'll spend a little bit of time talking about. We have had um, about a 40% decrease in our revenues for parking. That comes from a number of sources, but primarily from office workers that are no longer coming downtown and working in the office. They're working from home. Um, but we've also had impacting that is um, the lack of football, the lack of performances at the lead Center and at uh, Pinnacle Arena. So um, our budget is down about 40%. Um, we don't know exactly how, how that's going to trend in the future, but we think that uh, we will be addressing that by delaying and sometimes deferring uh, capital improvement programs. In, in the garages. Wayne Mixdorf is here today. I think he's in the adjacent room, and if, if, you're, if you have specific questions, he would be happy to, to help you um, to a help answer those. Two other um, major plans that have been accomplished in this past year mm -hmm. are the Affordable Housing, uh, Affordable Housing Action Plan and the South of Downtown. Uh, redevelopment and strategic plan. Both of those plans will guide future decisions of our department and others in terms of investment, where to invest our public funds, and how to invest them. Some of the successes that we'd like to talk about. Under economic opportunity, we have we, we continue to get a lot of developers interested in Lincoln, and that is a very good sign, uh, all the way from large projects to small projects. I've listed a few here. Um, the Block 65 project, which is 14th and N Streets. It's 180 uh, residential units. We're working with the developer. It's Argent, and we hope to have a redevelopment agreement that we can bring to you in a couple months on that project. Very small project, but uh, has been uh, approved by you, and that is the 2436R, which is 12 units and a little bit of retail that uh, that is is moving forward. The Oriental Market on North 27th Street was expanded to double its size. That was a project we assisted with. Uh, I mentioned the Cotner and P project earlier, and we've we've worked on two major streetscape projects this past year. Uh, one is the West O project, where we've developed a conceptual plan for the area and we've begun implementation. The first phase is street tree planting. We're now working with our consultant to see how much uh, bikeway we can build uh, with the funds we have immediately and how much we will be staging in, in future years. Uh, we've also completed a plan for the Haymarket South area. That's not only streetscape, but it is also parking. We're, with an emphasis on creating more parking, more on-street parking, more surface parking to help serve that area. Parking operation successes, we, as I mentioned earlier, we're just about to complete the Eagle Garage. Uh, the Block 4 Garage is underway. Um, we, we have a new parking Parking Services Office and Operations Center, which coordinates a lot of the efforts, allows us to uh, have fewer staff in the garages and, and helps our budget in that way. On the administration side, as I said, we, we do acquire, we've acquired about 165 parcels this past year. 
acquired and sold uh, for various city departments. We've completed a number of extreme blight studies. Extreme blight is something that's been approved by the voters and now is being considered by the legislature. If that moves ahead and the governor signs it, we'll be able to do a 20-year TIF in areas that are declared extremely blighted. And, and we're working with several developers now that are interested in that. And uh, we'll be developing a policy on how we use that and, and uh, what kinds of things it funds. In our Livable Neighborhoods Division, um, they've been very busy. They're working on the lead control program, uh, the coordinated action plan, the south of downtown plan. And um, as I said, they are working with a number of other agencies to make those things a reality. Our goals? Under economic opportunity, we want to continue to use TIF. We wanted to use it in the in in a very uh, flexible yet creative way on the big projects, small projects all across the city. Our parking parking operations. We want to finish the two garages we have in place and uh, look to the future. Uh, at this point, the future is somewhat clouded in terms of parking because of. Uh, the decrease in revenues, but we think that'll return, and it's just a matter of getting through this this time and getting back to normal. Livable neighborhoods, adjusting the, administering the home program, the CDBG program, and the various programs that, that I've talked about. And in the administration, our goals would be continue to track housing goals across the city. What are we? What have we accomplished with the housing programs? Where do we need to maybe tweak our efforts? And uh, we work with a number of other agencies also in in providing information to them on demographics and other related uh, programs. I think that's the end of my presentation. I would be happy to answer any questions you have. Does anyone question? Does anyone have any questions for Mr. McGee, Councilman? Oh, Councilwoman, Councilwoman Washington. Thank you. Oops. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, uh, Mr. McGee, I have two questions. Um, one, with the parking revenue uh, down forty percent, is any of that CARES fundable? <clears throat> Not that I am aware, although it's something that we have talked about to see if there is any ability to get assistance. And uh, we'll continue to look into that. But as far as I know, it is not. Yeah, well, we have I, not received any. I know in some years it's just the opposite. You make a little bit more than you actually spend, but it'd be mm -hmm. nice if. Uh, all right. That was one. And then I had a question I realized that, that could be directed to uh, Kate Bowles. As well, but I'm going to ask you to think about this. Um, I am interested in what we're doing uh, to either to support the return of a vibrant arts community uh, in Lincoln uh, that's been so severely affected by COVID. So, if you have anything you'd like to say on that, well, that's certainly an interest of ours as well. We're working with the Downtown Lincoln Association. And as part of the master plan, uh, we've identified an area that we're referring to as the music district. And we're hoping to uh, enhance that district uh, with programs, with uh, physical improvements. And I think that's one thing that, that we're doing that'll help uh, the arts. And um, that's probably the, the key thing that we're doing right now. Okay, I'll direct the sort of a near term uh, recovery piece to, to Kate. Thank okay. you. Any further questions? Thank you so much right. for coming Thank down you. and sharing this information with us. I'll invite Mr. Carlson back up if there's any closing remarks. Board here. I know I've just been taking notes, trying to put questions down and just continue the the offer if you have questions for me now or questions you can email later and we'll certainly gather information and get you everything you need are there any questions for john seeing none thank you so much
And that concludes our uh, budget uh, forecast meeting today. I just, as long as we're done with this meeting, maybe we could discuss a little bit about allowing more people to be in here during the regular council meeting. Uh, shift a little bit to a director from the Yeah, a quasi shift. Why don't we? I, I believe. Okay, if you want to go to a director's meeting? Well, I just want to discuss it. I don't think that we've had notice for a director's meeting uh, currently. Um, why don't we go ahead and adjourn mm -hmm. for right now, um, and then um, we can talk about how to move forward with that item. Okay. Okay. I did see more chairs in the lobby because mm -hmm. that's, yes, correct.